Thank you. Uh, can everybody hear me OK? It's good? Um, awesome. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me here. This is my first time presenting at a WordCamp. Uh, so it's a personal moment for me. And uh, I hopefully will have good and exciting things to, to tell you all. But it's, um, I'm really stoked to be here. So um, who am I? So I'm, uh, uh, as I said, Josh. I'm co-founder, head of product at uh, Pantheon website management platform. So we provide everything you need to build, launch, run, and iterate on awesome, amazing websites. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time um, and really excited to, uh, to work and get to know the WordPress community over the past couple years a lot better. Um, I actually had a BB Press site way back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, but then I went into the Drupal world for a decade, and, and now I'm kind of learning more about the other side of the fence. It's been really exciting and interesting and a wonderful community to get to know. Um, feel free to tweet at me, outlandish Josh. Um, um, or find weird things about me on the internet. Uh, let's go forward. So I position this question of uh, WP API and the decoupled architecture as part of a, a larger conversation that's happening in the software industry and on the web about monoliths versus microservices. Hey, have you guys heard people kind of talking about these two different things? Microservices, it's like all the hot stuff right now. So, so basically, this is an age-old debate in software, where the idea is, do you build a monolith, which is like one big hunk O software that you know, it kind of like maybe has some internal APIs, but it's logically one system and you deploy it once and it kind of does all the things for you. Or do you go with a microservices approach, excuse me, or a decoupled approach, which breaks apart different functionality into really you know, distinct separate pieces of software. And so in the monolith uh, model, they're, they're both, both have their merits. And in the monolith model, which is kind of like WordPress core, WordPress uh, and, and with plugins, is a, uh, it's a monolith because it's all one piece of software. And that one piece of software has your admin, your editorial UI, your display logic, your templates and themes, your user interface, everything else. Um, and this is cool, except for when you start to do more complicated, larger scale projects, especially those that evolve over time, maybe have a few different developers working on them, frequently what happens is it gets a bit jumbled inside the monolith because there aren't these clear lines of separation. Whereas the decoupled architecture, um, it enforces separation between these different concerns, and you know, that has some advantages to it, and, and some drawbacks, which we'll talk about. Um, so the monoliths, et cetera, really big things. Also think about monoliths like the beginning of 2001, you know, the giant like da, da, da. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> All right, we're on it. So uh, in uh, the, so, so people talk about how, uh, when I talk about this in CMSs uh, and WordPress, there's like, well, there's the theme layer. Like there's a difference between a theme and a plugin, and that is there is, you know, a, a architectural separation there. And it's true. There's a different directory that has themes than plugins. And there's some chuckles, because you know that as you begin to build real sites and the complexity grows, that boundary between what gets done in the theme and what gets done in the plugins and core is a very permeable boundary. Right? There's nothing that actually says you can do this stuff here but not there. It's just a matter of convention that you should do certain things in the theme and should not do certain things elsewhere. Um, but the reality is you can stick whatever code you want wherever, and it's probably going to work. And because it works, that means people will do it that way, even if it's not the most sustainable or um, good structure over the long Hall. So what you end up doing is kind of playing Twister, which is an exciting and often awkward game of chance, um, because you end up like you know, can get a little bit weird, um, and and sometimes can be a, a, a difficult to untangle. And uh, if you want to do something different, it can you know, you end up refactoring quite a lot. <coughs> So, uh, and, and if you go back to the monoliths, the 2001, like after the, the, the monkeys get very ragey at the monoliths because ultimately this feels like a very encumbering kind of thing. And especially when it was some other you know, beautiful human being who created some part of that that you're encountering later, the, the feelings of like, I can't believe they did it this way can become very, very powerful and, and frustrating. And, uh, and so these are the drawbacks of the monolithic architecture. Um, when you have a strong separation of concerns, right, that's where there's some kind of client, and then there's WordPress, right? And there's an HTTP API. So you're actually you're saying, we're using a network protocol, um, usually REST, and speaking JSON these days. That's how everyone does it. That's how the WP API does it, which is awesome. Um, that means that, like, 
you can't cross the streams, right? There's no way that you can call a random function from inside of a plugin or inside of core. The client can only make use of what is exposed over the network layer. Um, and what that means is everyone kind of gets to like do their own thing, and people who work on the client side can work on the client side, and people who work on the WordPress side can work on the WordPress side, and they have this you know, the separation of concerns, people talk about the API as a contract between the two different layers that makes it very clear what is done at which, at which layer and how it gets done. And so while this, uh, you know, again, we'll talk about how this isn't all roses and sunshine, there are significant advantages to building things this way because they are more cleanly structured and architected. Um, one of the other real big benefits is that you can use tools that you prefer. Um, who here, uh, in addition to being like a WordPress developer, also does like pure front-end development, like using JavaScript frameworks or other things like that? Yeah, so like, and, and it, that world is just like going nuts right now, right? There is so much innovation happening on the front end where, you know, it's, whether it's Backbone, Angular, Ember, React, um, all these different JavaScript frameworks that are coming up and helping people build like richer web experiences and all the new stuff that HTML5 makes possible, right? There's a lot of excitement that's happening in that world and the decoupled approach allows those of us who are from the CMS world, from the WordPress world, to really like, work well with those people. Like I, um, I was at a conference uh, called LoopConf, which was like a, not a WordCamp, but it was WordPre a WordPress developer <laughs> conference in Las Vegas uh, back in May. And they were co-located with an AngularJS conference. So like I kind of bounce between the two and see what people are talking about. And what's fascinating is the people in the AngularJS conference are talking about these like crazy awesome use cases, like how to save data offline in the browser and then automatically sync it up with like whatever when the user gets internet connection again. Like that's a super crazy cool use case. But their examples for what you're syncing up with are always like, um, yeah, it's just like a MongoDB instance with like no inter admin interface and like nothing else around it. And so like there's this huge amount of innovation happening on the front end, but they don't have rich back ends to talk to for the most part. They're just like they're kind of hand waving at that that part of it and saying, oh, we just you know stick it in a database in the cloud somewhere and it takes care of itself. And in the real world, that's not quite how it works. So there's a the huge opportunity for us to actually join together with the front end development community and do really amazing things together. Um, one of the other big benefits of approaching it with this model is that you can parallel track your progress. So when you think about um, who here, when they build websites, typically works on a team with more than one other person. Right, so a lot of us, right? Because you know, web, web development is a team sport. And what people are able to do when they talk about building websites with the decoupled approach is because you have that separation of concerns, you can say, front end team, go wild. Backend team, you know, build up the, the content model and the admin UI and everything else. And we have this contract with how we talk to each other, and you can actually do both at the same time. And it allows you to be productive in ways that would be, um, that are sometimes hard when you're building on a monolith. Because it's like, oh, I can't theme it yet because the custom post type isn't ready. And then people are like, well, we can't really, we don't really know what to do with these few settings because we haven't seen the designs yet. And you can get into all these kind of like catch 22s in your development. Whereas if you decouple things, again, with the upfront work of figuring out how they're going to talk to one another, it allows you to be productive on multiple tracks simultaneously, which is exciting. And, and it kind of can feel liberating to developers again. Um, one of the other benefits of doing this is future proofing. So if you have a decoupled infrastructure, replacing one piece of that is possible, right? It's a sane process. Like suppose um, you wanted to just completely do a redesign, right? If it's all decoupled, you could do that without refactoring the CMS. You could just c essentially create a different display layer. It talks to the same API, but it has a totally, di totally different design to it. And in a monolith, then we've all been through the, the process of like trying to redesign a site very often turns into a whole CMS overhaul. Um, just because it turns out that you know, we were playing Twister somewhere in there and it's not quite as easy as you would hope to just plop a different theme on it. Um, and, and on the flip side, if forever someone, if for whatever reason someone wanted to say replace WordPress with something else, they have the blueprint, they have the contract uh, to be able to do that. And so it basically gives, uh, uh, when you implement a project, it gives you some stronger sense of uh, future proofing. So you know, five years from now, 10 years from now, some of the tool things that you're building may still be quite valuable because you've built them in ways that are truly modular and can be plugged together in different ways. So caveats. <laughs> 
Um, I've, I've been talking about how this is super awesome and we're all going to ride rocket powered uh, unicorns shooting rainbows out of our golden guns. But it's not all wine and roses. So first of all, um, if you want to do this, <laughs> Uh, you have to like, it's, there's a learning curve. There's a serious learning curve to working this way. Like, uh, who, like who here feels like they know how to speak HTTP? Like a few, like I, I've done this for a little, but it's like, it's a thing, right? It's a whole new world to like really get into understanding how the protocol works and like what the different verbs are and different headers and utilities and so forth for doing all this. Now I will say for any of you who are interested in web development, not even just with WordPress, but if you are interested in building things for the internet, that's your passion. This is absolutely hands down one of the most valuable things you can learn because these are the core sort of protocols that allow everything to happen. And the most exciting things that are happening online are the things that connect different systems, right? So the people talk about, it's still a little hand wavy and hypey, but like the internet of things, like that's a thing, it's gonna happen. And it's gonna be driven by these types of protocols. Like the fact that like we do so much stuff with these devices now instead of devices that we sit in front of and type on, that's driven by these protocols. The, the fact that you can have websites that talk to each other absent a person, you know, there was like in the old days we had RSS, which is actually pretty awesome, but we've moved beyond that. There's now interactive ways that, you know, sites can like talk to each other. That's driven by these protocols. You will definitely not regret learning HTTP as a developer because it will serve you for years and years to come and it's really, really powerful. Um, but that said, it's a whole thing you gotta learn. It's like not trivial. Um, and there's a lot to it. Uh, another problem is that like WordPress does a lot of awesome things for you and WordPress plugins do a lot of awesome things for you. And if you take your client or your front end and you make it something that's not WordPress, none of these things are going to be done for you. And if you actually look, this is like the periodic table of WordPress plugins sorted by popularity. Um, almost like in the top 10, there's like four or five different SEO plugins. Right? If you have your own front end application, like none of, like the SEO problem is now yours um, to deal with. Now on, on, the, on the plus side, there used to be a lot of concern in the world that like if you had a JavaScript based front end, you, you couldn't get SEO and you had to maintain some kind of other static site that Google could index. That is actually not true. As of a year ago, Google's crawler has a fully functional JavaScript engine and it actually renders whatever your site is going to do and that's what it uses for SEO. That's important also so that people don't game the system. So you don't have to worry about that, but you do have to worry about what that result is. And WordPress isn't going to solve that problem for you. It's now your responsibility as the front end developer to make sure that whatever front end you're rendering is SEO friendly. And all these other things that go along with it, you know, string translation, internationalization, these are now problems that you get to have again, which may or may not be the best thing in the world. Um, I would also say that when you're thinking about developing with the WordPress API, it's probably a stretch to say that it's a great use case for um, a random plugin or a theme that is designed to just be plopped onto sites all over the place. Like in the future, there will probably be some use cases like that that are quite good. But at this stage in where we are with the development of the API itself and the documentation around it, the, the use cases for this are really like custom websites, custom applications, specific implementations for specific projects. So if that's not the type of work that you're doing, it may or may not have that much value for you. Because again, there's a lot of effort that goes into doing this. That said, a lot of like the really big WordPress sites are already making use of this stuff. So like, um, the, I know the time.com redesign, which is on WordPress, makes heavy use of an API. And they also power their mobile app off of the same API. Um, that's like really, really cool. But that's a, you know, that's a specific implementation for a particular customer that like would finance all that development. So it's like, it's not for little click it together type of projects at this point, um, just caveat. Um, I think one of the things that's really exciting about this though, that said, is that the development of this API will help grow the professional WordPress uh, developer ecosystem. Now WordPress is an open source project. Um, always has and always will have a really large community of users, you know, power users and hobbyists around it. 
But if you think about where WordPress needs to go over the next 10 years, it needs also people that kind of do it for a living, like for serious. And that like the, the amount of stuff that you have to learn and, and the complexity involved in all this requires the dedication that you really can only make. Like you either have to be independently wealthy and decide that you're just gonna become like the greatest WordPress artist in the world and like something else pays your bills, or you have to pay your bills by doing this stuff in order to like really invest the time that it takes to do amazing stuff with it. So, um, and I think that the WordPress API can help with that quite a bit because the types of use cases that it makes possible are the types of use cases that, um, that are, you know, clients are very interested in. They're, they're interested in financing. These are innovative, really cool uh, uh, types of things that you can do. And as more of us learn these techniques, it'll help us build our careers. Okay. So that's sort of like my high-level preamble, like what the heck is all this and why do we care about it? I'm going to talk about some specific ways that I am actually seeing people do this in the real world right now. So these are like people who are um, using our platform, um, people that I know through my connection to the developer community. These are like real-world use cases that show you how um, the WordPress API and decoupled infrastructures are being uh, utilized. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so the first and probably the most common is uh, the idea of the uh, building a uh, architecture that uses a static uh, renderer or a static generator. Um, so there are all these kind of like static websites are going through a little mini renaissance, and again, it's because of the the I believe that's because of the the all of the pizzazz and and innovation that's happening in the front end world. So people talk about Jekyll, uh, Sculpin, all these other things that are just basically designed to look at you know they're 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 out of the box. Their thing is, oh, I'll look at a bunch of markdown files that you have here, and then I'll put it together with some templates and then spit out real HTML at the end and you can just FTP that somewhere. Like going back to the really like the old, old days of the internet. Um, but the, uh, the appeal of those things is that they provide someone who's a front end developer with like a really kind of like streamlined, no cruft, no need to worry about the, the idiosyncrasies of the CMS uh, approach to doing a beautiful minimal design. Like if you look at these sites that, you know, they look really pretty and you open the page source and it's like there's almost nothing there. Like there's kind of a beauty to that um, because they're doing the minimum amount of code necessary to achieve their result. And like actually the more you can achieve with the less code you write, that's kind of like a, the mark of a you know, truly great developer. Um, and so what people are doing is they're, they're constructing architectures that utilize those static generation techniques, but rather than saying, oh, in order to change or edit the content, you have to have someone who's comfortable opening a text editor and working on a markdown file, they just talk to a WordPress API backend. And so they can fetch out all the posts and essentially build the equivalent to all those markdown files out of WordPress and then generate the static result. Either you know, when you make a change, you can run a script that says generate and it'll make the HTML files. And then there's people who have like little apps that kind of generate stuff in real time if necessary. Um, and this is pretty cool because the sites that result, because they're static, are like super secure. Like you can't really hack a static site. Um, and they scale really well because serving static content is something that's very easy to, to make fast and, uh, and scale out across like potentially millions of requests. So those are definite benefits. And they also help people use a lot of these, again, the innovative front end tool chains that are out there. So you have like, um, anybody ever heard of this thing called Pattern Lab? No? Okay, I would, if, maybe a little bit. Um, if you're into front end development, I would look up Pattern Lab. It's this really interesting, you know, it sort of comes from this, uh, uh, this world where people who have like 10 years of experience with like the Adobe Creative Suite and so forth are basically saying, F this, like, no, I'm not gonna like make pretty pictures, I'm gonna make web. And they're like throwing down their tools that allowed them to make static images and starting to build tool chains that let them create dynamic objects that can be constructed into real things. And they design in the browser and they learn how to do this stuff. So Pattern Lab is like, it's both kind of a gestalt for like how to do this process called atomic design and then a set of tools for building that up. So we have a really interesting use case where somebody has like their Pattern Lab, oh thank you so much, their Pattern Lab tool chain is there for their designers and then that 
that gets picked up by like their little static generator that they wrote, and it talks to the uh, the WordPress API that their backend developers did, and they just have both of these things feeding out into this really beautiful website, and they can iterate on the design really quickly, and they can iterate on the content really quickly, and they're super happy with it. So it's it's pretty awesome, even if like your use case at the end of the day is sort of a static website. People are doing it uh, uh, decoupled stuff with that right now, and it's definitely working. So another really good one is the hybrid approach. So this is like where I've got a website and like 80, 90, 90 maybe like 99% of the website, it's just like normal WordPress. But then there's that one area of the website that is like a super dynamic interface to something. Like maybe it's a report generator, maybe it's some like statistics visualization, maybe it's like um, like real time, something real time with other users on the site. Like there's people who are doing stuff with like real time chat um, for forums and so forth. And uh, so what they have is um, the WordPress is still delivering most of the content for the web page, but then inside that web page, part of the content is a little JavaScript app, and that JavaScript app is running in the customer's browser, and it's talking to WordPress via the API and able to do things in real time for people. And that's kind of a cool, cool use case. Uh, another sort of like the more extreme version of that is sort of the quote unquote single page app, right? And this is like what people are doing when they're implementing with, with Angular, um, Ember, React, and so forth. It's like you don't actually, the, the browser just loads one page at the beginning. And that page has all the code and JavaScript in it that then whatever you click on in that page, it's just like psh, phoning out to the, the WordPress backend, loading that content, and then rendering whatever it was. I saw a use case for this where somebody had built a website for, um, a, uh, a museum. And it was super awesome because basically what it did was it loaded the, the first page and that first page included like, you know, whatever, like here's the, like a, a beautiful outdoor shot of the museum. And it prefetched a bunch of the other images that would, that would go off of there. And it's like, it's prefetching these things and they're big images because it's a museum website and it's beautiful stuff. And then when you're clicking around in it, it's just like lightning fast because it actually preloaded like the next stuff that you wanted to click already. It wasn't having to like go and like fetch that and render it. Um, uh, after you clicked. It was already there for, for the user after they clicked on it. And sort of like, um, any, anybody have experience back in the day building like Shockwave Flash kind of apps and stuff? So this is the new school of doing that. And it's frankly much more powerful and much more interesting. Um, and, and, and in fact, I, I, I uh, had a mailing list discussion with somebody about this uh, when I was over the summer. And they're like, you guys talk about decoupled like it's this new thing. It's totally not new. I was doing that with Shockwave back in the day. I had like my Shockwave front end, and it was talking to my, my CMS back end to load all the content. This is old hat. And in some ways, like that, that's correct. Although I think those use cases were very few and far between. And probably at the time, 2008, 2009, they were like, kind of like really doing a lot of development work to build their own API on the back end. The beauty is you can do the same sorts of techniques now with these modern JavaScript front ends and the WordPress API and be like much, much further along just from the get-go. So that's exciting. Like if you want to build dynamic applications and so forth, the single page app is pretty exciting to look at. Likewise, you have the native mobile app or the Internet of Things, right? I'll throw that out there because it doesn't have to be a phone. It could be your fridge, theoretically. <laughs> Uh, and it can talk to the website the same way that you know um, uh, the single page app would. So it's quite common for someone to have a website. They may still have the actual website itself. So the website itself is just you know humming away and it's running and it's providing the like regular old browser user experience. And then there's a mobile app for whatever the website is doing, whether it's a nonprofit trying to like solicit donations or a news site or whatever. And that mobile app, written in whatever ob Objective-C or Java, is just talking to the same API, the, the API on the same website that you're hitting when you go through a browser. And that way, you know, there's one place where all your content is, and people can get it and, and, and uh, update it themselves. Or you have people who do things where they're like, you know, I built a mobile app, which is like a little game, um, but I want to be able to refresh the content that's around the core game engine really easily. And so I build myself a little website with an API on it that allows me to adjust the content, the help text, the intro text, who knows, whatever. And the, the phone is just like you know, calling out to that API. Again, this is the, the language. Speaking HTTP is the way in which these things communicate. And so our ability to have tools that we know and are quite powerful, like WordPress, put us in the mix of these conversations, which is really exciting. Uh, and the last one, what I think is kind of cool, is the CMS on CMS use case. 
Uh, I, I used to call uh, the initial like decouple this sort of industry standard term like, a couple years ago when people were first trying to do it. I like to call it headless because um, it kind of seems cool, like it's the headless horseman riding along to build your awesome website. But it's a little obscure and kind of maybe violent imagery. Um, <laughs> And, and, and when people were doing this, I was like, OK, this is like, this is like the zombie CMS, because it's like the body of one CMS and the head of another. Um, but again, that didn't really take, take off. So um, uh, this is a really interesting use case. And it's crazy, but there are people that are doing it and doing it very successfully. And basically what it is is it's a separation of concerns, but not technologies. So you want the benefits that we were talking about before, where you, where you can parallel track things, and you have like a, 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 the ability to you know, put things where they belong. But your skill set is like, well, we got WordPress, 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 and WordPress. So you can still do all this stuff. You just use WordPress and WordPress as your, as your mix of things. And you have one website that just cares about display. Right? It doesn't really care that much about, uh, about what the content is or how the content is managed. And that allows you to have um, one track of development that just focuses on how content is presented. And there's no way that the theme can actually do something weird that would crash the site or whatever, because it's just talking to a back end. The back end website just cares about making the content accessible. And this is an interesting approach, like if you want to have multiple front ends. So you could have a back end website that's your content store, and then one front end website that's just like the regular web and then like, another front end that maybe like, is uh, useful for, the, um, for mobile apps, uh, and another website that's like, exposing things to a command line. That's another use case that isn't super common, but I've seen people do it. You can build like, a command line interface that just like, talks over the HTTP to, uh, to your website and does things. It's, it's very exciting. So, um, and this, this, if, you, if you go in this way, like this is for, if you have like, a bigger, more ambitious project, you could really think about your like, WordPress, Installation as a kind of a microservice bootstrapping unit, and like you could just have like your core content WordPress and like these various different microservices all around it that are providing different functions. And if you, you know, again, with the core capabilities that you have, you can build pretty interesting things fairly rapidly. Um, and and it's really happening in the real world, and it's actually working for folks. Um, so it's kind of to, to conclude. The shockwave flash person is correct, and the, uh, the curmudgeon. And the, the people who say, like, the people who are interested in static sites are also kind of correct. This is not brand new stuff. This is sort of an everything old is new again kind of moment um, that we're in, where the core protocols that we've always used to build the web are, uh, are empowering us more and more. And the techniques that we're, <coughs> a lot of these techniques, um, were used very, very early on in some of the architectures for like the first wave web stuff. It was just that the, the available tools were like C++ and Java. And so there weren't that many people who were empowered to take these tools and build with them. And the really exciting thing to me about where we are right now is not just that we have a bigger and more boisterous internet, but also that we have many, many, many more developers and there's, a, there's sort of a democratization of access to the tools that allow us to build these kind of fundamental capabilities and utilize the fundamental capabilities of the web. So WordPress is democratizing publishing, which I love. But it's also democratizing, you know, it's, it's to a smaller audience, but it's still very democratizing, the ability to build these kind of first-rate web applications, these first-rate nodes in our network that we're creating. And we're hel it's helping us to build a more vibrant, stronger, more interesting internet. Um, and I, so I think, to me, that's the most exciting thing about this. So if any of this stuff is interesting to you, you should really you know, try out a proof of concept. I think that there's a, I'm trying to work my way up to having one that people can use as a starting place for hacking, which is just the, have you ever seen the um, to do MVC, right? So all the JavaScript frameworks that are out there, they kind of had a challenge a couple years ago. Where it's like build a to-do list app in your framework. Show us you can do it, and then open source the code. Um, and it'd be really, really trivial. In fact, I got like halfway there on my cab ride from the airport to the hotel last night to do that, but with WordPress as the back end. So like your to-dos that are being uh, managed in the to-do MVC app are actually you know, posts or custom post types in WordPress. And while that's not the most amazing and practical implementation that you would like do, it like demonstrates the power and kind of t takes people through like the first I do this, it talks to that, it responds with this. And as we can kind of learn as a community how how these connections are made and what's possible when we're able to like speak the language of HTTP and uh, uh, kind of keep this like more complicated architecture in our heads. I think really amazing things are going to happen. 
So thank you for listening to me. I, hopefully this was at least of some interest to you, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, yes, and then we'll go there. I have actually two questions. One of them is, what is, I don't know if you know, what is the status of when it's going to be incorporated into WordPress 4? And my second question is that I'm experimenting with it, and I'm having trouble working through um, authentication. I don't know if that's getting into much of the weeds here, but what advice would you have in dealing with authentication? Good questions. So the first question was, uh, uh, WordPress API, the plugin, is currently being developed as a feature plugin, which means it has the potential to be baked into WordPress core. And that's what most everybody says that they want. Although everyone says that they want it, it keeps being like, ah, maybe it's always two releases from now. Because <laughs> um, it's never the next release, but it's probably the one after. But uh, so the, the short answer is I don't know when it will be in core. I think it, it, the, the real challenge, if you want to know, is that there's a lot of stuff with the, um, the XML RPC API and other stuff that like some popular plugins have done that potentially conflict with what uh, WP API is trying to do. So that, that's all the stuff that needs to get ironed out before I think it can go into core. Um, and it will probably take a lot more time. Like the 2.0 version of the WP API, WP API just sort of landed. It's still beta-ish. Um, and so I would say two releases from now is optimistic, more, probably more like three or four releases from now. Um, but there's no reason that you shouldn't start working with it now. Like I think its inclusion in core will just mean that there's a lot more of an audience. And potentially, the, in, that's, at that point, it becomes a lot more interesting to be like, oh, I could build like, some phone app that talks to all WordPresses. And like, that's kind of amazing. But if you're looking to build particular implementations with it now, there's no reason not to just do it with the plugin. Um, and then your second question was getting started with authentication. So uh, there is a uh, plugin for the plugin that enables uh, basic auth, which is not necessarily the greatest thing for production because it, it means you have to like put uh, your credentials into something that you know is either on the client side or on the server side. And this is to like to, to post new posts or update posts or delete posts. Um, but it, it makes it very easy to get rolling from a development standpoint, because HTTP basic auth is really easy to build into a client. Um, there is also an OAuth plugin, and there's a little tutorial for setting that up as part of the docs. And that's much more scalable and sustainable. Um, so if you want to build something that's going to go into production and have like, lots of clients out there using it, I would look at the OAuth thing. If you're thinking about like uh, in the static site generation context, where like I control the client too, and it's not something I'm like putting in the hands of users. There's no reason you couldn't use basic auth for that. Does that help? Cool. Uh, over here. Yeah, that was basically my question. That is, this is fantastic. I was curious about where the WordPress core was going and whether or not it was going. Yeah, I mean, the the everyone's avowed interest is in having this in WordPress core. Basically, that it's like you know people get really starry eyed and kind of. You know, their pupils dilate when they think 27% of the internet with all of our API. Oh! Um, but that's going to take some time. Uh, I, but I still, but my, my, the, the, the takeaway that I would suggest is don't wait. Right? This is the plugin, the 2.0 branch of the plugin is the plugin that they're going to try to get into core and at some point will. I don't know whether it'll be 2.1, 2.2, who knows. But it's, you can build with it now. And so if you're interested in this stuff, Get ahead of the curve um, and start learning the ins and outs of it today because you don't need to wait for it to be in core for it to be quite powerful and make use of it. Yeah? Um, are you guys preparing on the hosting side your infrastructure for the complete rollout, or how does that look on, on the server side? Uh, so I think from the perspective of people who run web infrastructure, um, the main concerns are ensuring that you're, you don't, as, as a hosting provider or infrastructure provider, you don't get in the way of people wanting to speak HTTP to one another. And so that's something where, I mean, we've been supporting use cases like this for a while. And so we're, you know, there's always edge cases, who knows, but we're fairly confident that everything like this works on Pantheon. And, and for most other hosts, I would imagine it would too. The only cases I, I, where this wouldn't work were, is if people were doing something very, <coughs> Very peculiar in terms of how they, I don't know, like some crazy weird shared hosting setup might have issues with it. <coughs> Excuse me, but I don't think so. I think for the most part, this stuff, you know, it's it is the native language of the web. So for the most part, it should you shouldn't have too many infrastructure issues getting it working. Yes, and then yes. Um, what's HTTP? 
Ah, what's HTTP? Good question. Sorry, I you know blew, blew right by it. Um, so HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, um, and that is the core rules of how when you type an address into your browser and hit enter, what happens? It requests something. There's actually there's a great diagram. I used to have this like up in the bathroom at work where it's like, <laughs> well, so the beautiful thing about HTTP is like HTTP as it's delivered to you as a cust as a user, as a consumer of it, seems so freaking simple, right? It's like I type the address in, I hit enter, and it works. Um, and if you actually go through the protocol, it's doing so many interesting things around the edges to cover all these different cases where what if there's a redirect, or what if you have an authorization check, or what if there's a problem, and so forth. And the actual uh, flowchart diagram of how the protocol works is like, like it's like got 50 steps in it, which is kind of crazy. And so that's what I'm saying. Like the Swedish chef, it's a real thing. Like it takes a while to learn all that. But basically, it's the protocol by which browsers request resources from the web or different things on the web talk to each other. Yes? Um, does all this create any additional security issues? So it can create security issues. I would say, out of the box, no, because the, the WP API team is very security minded. So what is exposed from the beginning is just the same stuff that would be exposed on the front page of your site, right? You get the API for posts, it just gives you all the posts. I can kind of show you actually real quick. I have like that, what I was hacking on in, in the cab. Um, so let's make this much bigger. So let's just, and here you see I was messing with, ad, with uh, auth. So let's just suppose I was like, uh, wanted to get my list of posts, right? So I'm doing that. And then what it's doing is you can see there's like the hello world post is in there. But it's giving it to me as a structured data format in JSON, which is something that's designed to be machine readable. And as long as you don't say open up the permissions on the site so that like any user could post or update or delete stuff, and as long as you don't accidentally leak out credentials where like you, you know, you're, you're, you're following best practices in terms of how you grant authorization to a client to read or write this data, it doesn't create any uh, in, its, in and of itself, it doesn't create any security issues. Um, I think that probably, as we'll discover as more people do it, all of the kind of standard security problems that might come along with a poorly configured or poorly maintained WordPress site are still, they're still there. Uh, but this doesn't necessarily open anything new up. And, and to the extent that the API is much more structured than like, you know, it's pretty hard to use an API to try to do a SQL injection. And if you've got a client that's just speaking over JSON, it's hard to have that include a cross-site request forgery. So in some ways, it actually, because it, it tightens and narrows the separation of concerns, can help enforce better security practices. Anybody else? Yeah. So that uh, flowchart for the HTTP is yeah. interesting. But we don't all want to go to your bathroom. <laughs> is there somewhere online? Do you know where you like you got it from? Or something? You, you know, I don't know off the top of my head, but I should I should add it. To, to what, here's what I can try to do. I will try to find it again and stick it in my slides next to the Swedish Chef before I post them. <laughs> um, so sorry. Here's that same thing in like with like a pretty output format. So you can see like you're just talking to WordPress and it's giving you you know this list of posts and all the kind of metadata about them and so forth. And this is something that a computer your own program can read very easily and then interpret in its own way. Any more for any more? Cool. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.